Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch. Now, I've been trying to include what I consider an old school brain scratch uh, once a month. They were kind of more unsolvable mysteries that I started with when I started this show. Uh, Lately, we've been covering a lot more true crime and that kind of stuff. But every now and then, once a month, I like to sprinkle in one of these stories. Uh, Last month, we covered one that was in the Antarctic. And I had someone, a friend, a bit of a friend of mine named Jay Swan Kilo J, who has been suggesting cases. I've actually covered many cases that he's suggested. And uh, he was doing a bit of the footwork, trying to pull together Uh, last month's Antarctic case and this one. And then once I started seeing the research, I was like, okay, these need to be broken up. So essentially, this is kind of part two to last month's. Um, It's not directly related, but it's just similar instances because we're once again talking about one of those bases near the South Pole. Really interesting one here. Many people consider the case we're talking about today the high, it has the highest probability of actually being the first murder case to have taken place in the Antarctic. And the person that we're talking about is Rodney Marks. So let's go ahead and jump in. And once again, I just want to give a very big thank you to Jay Swan Kilo J for all the help uh, throughout. It feels like I've known you for a couple of years now. So I really, really appreciate it. So last month's our Antarctic mystery about Carl Dish actually took place at the Bird Station. This one takes place at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station, and that's a United States scientific research station at the South Pole. It is located on the high plateau of Antarctica at an elevation of 2,835 meters or 9,301 feet above sea level. Uh, It is the only inhabited place on the land surface of Earth from which the sun is continuously visible for six months and then is continuously dark for the next six months. Thus, during each year, this station experiences one extremely long day and one equally long night. The continuous period of darkness and dry atmosphere makes the station an excellent place from which to make astronomical observations. The number of scientific researchers and members of the support staff housed at the Amundsen-Scott station has always varied seasonally, with a peak population of around 200 in the summer operational season from October to February. In recent years, the wintertime population has been around 50 people. And we are talking about a mystery that takes place during the winter season there, so uh, it is somewhere around 50 people that are at the station, starting with an article over at NewYorkTimes.com. Scientist dies at South Pole Research Site, and this is May 17th of 2000 that it's being reported. Uh, If I recall correctly, he actually died on May 12th. An Australian astrophysicist died suddenly of undetermined causes Friday at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, a research center operated by the National Science Foundation, and his body must remain there until the southern winter ends in October. That is another really bizarre aspect to trying to process this as a homicide, if that's indeed what this is. Um, We don't even have his body being moved to a location where a real autopsy can happen for several months. And that's part of the challenge with this case in particular. But let's continue. Uh, It was only the third death at the poll in nearly 35 years. Uh, This mentions the other two. And interestingly, it doesn't mention the case that we covered uh, about Carl Dish uh, last month. But the other two cases that this is referring to are pretty clear uh, and obvious accidents. This case in particular... There's just a whole different twist to this one. While the death of the astrophysicist Rodney Marks is not thought to be related to the harsh conditions at the pole, it is a reminder that scientists operating the growing number of experiments there must contend with a perilous isolation when medical emergencies arise. Now, they do have some staff there. They do have uh, essentially a bit of medical services, but... Uh, You know, when you have an emergency that reaches beyond the scope of those local services, you're just really in trouble. There's basically no way to get a flight in or out. Uh, There's another story that happened there where a, a doctor at the station, a woman found a lump in her breast and basically had to treat it herself while she was there until they could get back to the season where they can actually get a plane out of there. And what they did in that case was they actually airdropped supplies that she needed to her. 
Uh, so really, really interesting challenges. And then, of course, outside of that, you've got the isolation of living in this type of condition, being around the same 50 people, being in these confined spaces for a prolonged period of time, certainly a psychological aspect that's going on here as well. Dr. Marks, who was 32, had complained of severe breathing difficulties and reported to the station's physician, said Adair Lane, an astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. His condition did improve for a while, Dr. Lane said, and he was conscious and was able to converse with the people attending him. And suddenly his heart stopped and all the resuscitation failed. The cause of death will probably not be determined until the body is removed and an autopsy performed, said Carl Erb, director of the foundation's office of polar programs. And I did a little bit of a newspaper search around this as well. And essentially this article is copied practically nationwide across the US and of course uh, in New Zealand and Australia as well. It's just all over the place on pretty much a stretch from May 15th to May 17th, this same information. But then the media kind of goes dry. Uh, all of a sudden there's not a whole lot of updates about this. It takes a few years before some of those updates start coming out and we will certainly get to those updates. But let's continue here with another article at sciencemag.org. Rodney Marks was the sole operator of the Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory, uh, nicknamed ASTRO. The loss has devastated the staff of 49 who are cut off from the outside world until November as planes can't land in the frigid conditions. The nine remaining scientists at the base will try to put ASTRO back into operation. On the 12th of May, Marks was walking from a research building back to the main station when he began to have trouble breathing. He checked in with the base's doctor, who consulted by satellite with medical experts, but his condition worsened. After several hours, his heart stopped and he could not be revived. Marks had passed all physical exams before he headed to the pole last October and had spent a winter at the pole once before in 1998. Um, there is another interesting consideration about what they had on hand there to try to help him that we're going to touch by the end of this uh, might have made a big difference. One piece of equipment not working properly. We'll get to it. ASTRO, which is part of the University of Chicago Center for Astrophysical Research in Antarctica, uses a 1.7 meter telescope to measure the spectra of atomic carbon and carbon monoxide in the Milky Way. Before he died, Marx had been fixing a tricky problem with one of the telescope's receivers, which must be chilled to near absolute zero. Rodney was doing a really su superb job, said Astro Project Manager Adair Lane. He was also the only one at the pole trained to work with Astro. We don't yet know how hard it will be for others to put things back into working order. So as you can imagine, with a crew of only 50 people there, um, I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of cross training. There was probably a lot of specialists and if something happens to one of those specialists, um, that's essentially what we're seeing here. With Rodney being taken out of the project, uh, we've got other scientists trying to scramble and figure out how can we pick up the work and make this season still worthwhile in terms of research and honor the work that Rodney was doing as well by continuing that. So jumping to another article, this one at newspapers.com, um, which I'll include a link to down below. I think they allow a free trial, so you guys might be able to see uh, some of these articles, but um, I am paying for this service. But I just wanted to get a little bit of backstory, and here we have a picture of Rod Dr. Rodney Marks. Uh, Born in Geelong, he held a bachelor's degree in science from Melbourne University and a doctorate in physics from the University of New South Wales before joining the Smithsonian. He was a member of the close-knit community at South Pole Station, and I know his loss will be felt very deeply there, said Dr. Carl Erb, director of the Foundation's Office of Polar Programs. He extended his condolences to the family and friends of Dr. Marx. The foundation gave no indication of how the death was being handled officially. And once again, it's just mentioning that the South Pole is essentially cut off from the world from March to October. Uh, the harsh weather means that no aircraft can land there in winter. And on top of that, we have an article here from the Sydney Morning Herald. This is 15th of May. So at the same time that you have the press picking up this story and running with it, 
You've also got the obituary um, that is coming out at the same time here. So, of course, it talks about all the family that um, Rodney is leaving behind. Rodney passed away suddenly while serving at South Pole Station, Antarctica, where he was undertaking astrophysical research. He was an extraordinary person who was smart, creative, talented, kind, generous, sensitive, compassionate, and funny. We will miss him greatly. He will also be missed by his friends and colleagues worldwide. And maybe one colleague in particular, Rodney had recently gotten engaged to someone that also works at the station. She actually picked up a winter shift specifically to stay there with him. Uh, and she was there through all of this as it was going on as well. Uh, there's a second part that I just want to touch on also. Uh, the memories of our happy time together will be cherished always. We are proud of all your achievements. You will live in our hearts forever. And of course, they talk about where the service is going to be held. Actually, one of many services held for Rodney. Uh, we can see here at southpolestation.com. You might remember that website from last month's episode as well. A memorial service was held at the South Pole Station Saturday evening, May 13th. Rodney's family held a memorial service at 2.30 Wednesday afternoon, May 17th. An informal gathering in Rodney's memory was held in Boston Thursday evening, May 18th. But believe it or not, th there's more. Uh, and before we get to what's more, here are some photos of Rodney. You can see he's actually uh, at work at the station in many of these photos. On top of that, uh, he liked to perform in bands. Uh, here you can see he's actually colored his hair purple. Uh, he's wearing a Sonic Youth shirt. But they've got some pictures here also of him actually performing. And they had a band for the station, and he would perform with that band as well. Um, there's another shot of him here. And this shot in particular is taken only about six days before his death. So uh, what other... What other ways did they honor Rodney? One very big one here, and uh, I just once again have to thank South Pole Station for uh, keeping such good records on all this stuff. This message comes on July 4th from Dave Pernick, who was also at the station. Yesterday, we had a funeral for our friend here. It seems like a long time since he died in order to have a funeral, I know. But here's what happened. His death was a surprise. And the normal procedure is to store the body in the cold somewhere until it can be flown out. They put him on a sled and stashed him in an arch, kind of out of sight, as to not spook anyone that might work in there during rounds and such. Some of us were thinking about a week later that this was wholly unsatisfactory and was not treating our friend with the proper respect. After all, he came here to study the sky. At least he could be put to rest under the aura and stars. Let's build him a casket and bury him out at the pole for the rest of the winter. Okay, I don't have much experience building caskets, and I thought we could do it in 10 days or so. Not. So a team of volunteers during off hours made a beautiful casket. It's really sweet. All oak with decorative trim, all routed smooth, and an awesome grain and finish. Copper rails with brass brackets polished to a mirror finish, and a padded and upholstered interior and a plaque inscribed to him with a brass inlay of the constellation Scorpio. It weighs, I estimate, around 250 pounds and is quite a work of art. We are very proud of it. One neat aspect is that we scraped up a lot of parts from stuff that normally wouldn't be used for this purpose. Plumbing pipe and tablecloth and bearing bronze, egg crate bedding foam. It took a month to build it. At the pole, we placed him into the ice grave with a great deal of cooperation and teamwork. Two people spoke, simple and elegant, and definitely cool. Rodney would think so. This place is harsh, but in its extremes, there is also beauty. The aura and incredible sky can be amazing. And now, our friend is laid to rest, albeit temporarily, under that sky. Uh, I was just really moved to hear how they honored him, how hard they worked to give him a proper burial, even if it was only going to be for a period of months. Um, and I think it just goes to show that that's one of maybe the upsides of being in this type of community. A small group of people, sure, you're all crammed together, but that also makes you guys very close 
in a way as well. And uh, this just really kind of pointed that out for me. And that's why I wanted to share it with you guys. So where is the mystery in all this? You know, the official word from the National Science Foundation is this looks like it was just a natural death. We're kind of not sure what happened, but there was no obvious sign that something had been, there, there was no obvious sign of foul play, essentially. Well, once he gets back, we learn about the true cause of death here. This is an article that was originally in Science Magazine, um, and it looks like it's been captured in a PDF format. If you only read one article on this case after you see this video, I highly recommend that it's this one. So check out those links in the description box below. Look for the one that says ucla.edu, and that will be this article. There's a lot more detail in here. I'm gonna cover most of it in this video, but if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty of it, this is an excellent article. On the 30th of October, after flights resumed between Antarctica and New Zealand, Mark's body was taken out of storage and flown to Christchurch, New Zealand, on its way to burial in his native Australia. In mid-December, Martin Sage, a forensic pathologist in Christchurch, delivered another shocker. Mark's, apparently in good health, had died of methanol poisoning. In dispassionate prose, Sage described how Marx had consumed approximately 150 milliliters of a colorless and slightly sweet tasting liquid, commonly known as wood alcohol under unknown circumstances. By the time Marx visited the base's rudimentary medical center, his system had converted the methanol used routinely at the pole to clean scientific equipment into formic acid, leading to the acute acidosis that caused his symptoms. So apparently this type of poisoning takes a couple days to take effect. And when Marx went to the doctor that was on the scene there, um, the doctor asked him how long it had been since he had alcohol, because Rodney was known to be a pretty heavy drinker. Uh, and Rodney said it had been a couple days. The doctor kind of initially assumed that Rodney might have been going through alcohol withdrawals. Obviously, that is not correct. But there's another interesting aspect about methanol. Let's jump to Wikipedia here. Methanol is the simplest alcohol. It is a light, volatile, colorless, flammable liquid with a distinctive odor similar to that of ethanol or drinking alcohol. Methanol is, however, far more toxic than ethanol. So interestingly, could you confuse methanol for alcohol? It seems like it's possible. Now, uh, in terms of them using ethanol on site, like that article mentioned, they only use it for cleaning um, specific items and it is kept pretty much locked up outside of that. So how he would have gotten access to it is a big question. Uh, some people wonder, is this something that he did to himself, which doesn't make a lot of sense because he kept going to the doctor for help as things were getting worse. Uh, he was lucid. He was able to speak to them. He could have told them, you know, what he, what he did. And why is he going to the doc to the doctor for help if he's intending on ending his own life? It really is not logical. On top of that, uh, you know, we have his career going well. We have him uh, finding the love of his life, playing in his band. Um, by all signs, he appeared to be kind of enjoying what he was doing. So, not that that rules it out completely, but uh, at least for what people that were close to the situation are saying, they have pretty much ruled out the possibility, as well as the coroner, uh, that he did this to himself. It just it doesn't seem to hold up logically. So what does that mean? Uh, is this an accident or is there some possibility that someone did this to him? So that's where we jump forward. Um, there's basically no news about this for a while, but then in 2006, it kind of comes back up. This is from the province, a paper in Canada from the 14th of December, 2006. Police probing first suspected Antarctic murder. And this article lets us know about a uh, detective, Detective Senior Sergeant Grant Wormald, who is working on this case. He winds up working on this case for years. Thankfully, there is one very well-written article that we're going to go over that tells us a lot about his investigation and some of his ideas and conclusions about what's going on here. Um, but we see it pretty clear here. Finally, someone is considering the possibility that this is actually a murder, that someone could have put the methanol 
into a drink. And there's some other interesting aspects outside of that. Uh, we have in 2008, another inquest. So if I, if I recall correctly, there's three inquests that happen with this case uh, in 2000, of course, around the actual time. It comes back up, I believe, in 2002. And then I think in 2006, they start their third inquest. And the results from that kind of become public in 2008. Here we have a different coroner who is um, basically, once again, determining the cause of death is acute methanol poisoning, and he doesn't know why the, the circumstances remain unclear. Uh, this article mentions that theories have been aired that Marks may have been the victim of a prank or something more sinister at the hands of one of the other 49 people working at the U.S. Polar Station. So thankfully, we have the New Zealand Herald that is covering this story. And this is the first of two articles we're going to use by them. Um, I just like calling out when I see newspapers that are doing really good work. And in particular, the second article they do here is just a home run in terms of um, good investigative research and pulling together all these different pieces of story from different places and putting them all in one spot. Kind of what I try to do here with Brain Scratch. So I always like calling out when I find that. But at this article, New Zealand probe into death hits icy wall. This is from the 24th of September, 2008. New Zealand authorities hamstrung by a lack of cooperation from American agencies have been unable to solve the mystery of a man's death at the South Pole. His family do not believe they will ever know how their son was poisoned. Quote, and I don't think we're going to try to find out any more in regards to how Rodney died. I'd see that as a fruitless exercise, Dr. Marx's father, Paul Marx, told the Herald. Coroner Richard McElray yesterday released his findings on the death of Dr. Marx. It was considered possible Dr. Marx, a binge drinker, had accidentally drunk the methanol, a poisonous liquid used as a solvent or fuel, but his father found this inconceivable. It was also possible that someone else had a role in his consuming it for a prank or a more sinister move. Um, and that's what gets really tough about this case. People that are close to him say it's ridiculous. He's such a detail-oriented person with his work that the likelihood that he he would have accidentally drunk the methanol just doesn't make any sense for the type of person he was. Is that the same information that the investigator is going to find as we get into things? Well, let's continue. So here's that second article, and I want to call out in particular David Fisher, the author of this, for just doing a bang-up job. Uh, 16th of March, 2009. When a young astrophysicist died in Antarctica, his death was blamed on natural causes. Now David Fisher investigates whether Rodney Marks' death was the first murder on the ice. Rodney Marks was buried for a second time under the warm Australian sun in a bush cemetery not far from the beaches he surfed as a boy. Marks once chased his dreams all the way to Antarctica. It was there, in one of the world's coldest and most remote terrains, that Rodney Marks was buried for the first time. He died suddenly, and all of the questions that still surround his death, the most chilling is whether he is a victim of Antarctica's first murder. It wasn't until late October, on one of the fli first flights out, that Marx's body left Antarctica, traveling to Christchurch in New Zealand. There, an autopsy by Christchurch forensic pathologist Dr. Martin Sage found that Marx died from somehow ingesting the equivalent of a large glass of methanol. By the time this was discovered, the 49 people who left the South Pole alive had scattered across the world. Marx's living quarters had been cleaned up and potential evidence discarded as rubbish. That's one of the really tough aspects to this case because I think there's a lot that we can understand about the conditions that they were dealing with, but with them not being aware that this was a possible foul play situation, no one's trying to investigate. No one's going through his living quarters with that mindset. Hey, I need to look for something in here that's weird. Um, and you essentially just have it being cleaned up. I mean, these, these people need their resources, and I think there's an aspect of them potentially trying to be respectful and move forward from what has happened, and they wind up cleaning his living quarters, likely, if this is truly a murder, getting rid of evidence that could certainly help solve the case. But 
With witnesses gone and evidence trashed, finding the answers to Marx's death fell to Detective Senior Sergeant Grant Wormald of the New Zealand Police. The investigation was to take eight years, and in the end, the questions remained. Wormald did rule out some possible explanations. It was highly unlikely that he ended his own life. Marx was in love with Sonia Walter, whom he had met in Antarctica and planned to marry. An accident was also considered unlikely. Coroner Richard McElray's report ruled out none of these possibilities and raised another. An alternative possibility is he drank methanol through a third person's actions, either in the form of a prank or with a more sinister motive. The search for answers raised more questions. Why were there needle marks in the young scientist's arm? Um, very interesting question. So the doctor that he goes to see essentially notices that there's needle marks. Uh, he does ask him about it. And Marx basically tells him that uh, he did use some intravenous drugs um, before he came to the pole. But the description of these needle marks is that they appear to be pretty fresh. And then in a kind of a strange turn, uh, the doctor actually uses that same arm when he's withdrawing blood, uh, which some people are just questioning. Why would, if you see there's fresh marks there, why would you do that? But um, in the autopsy results, there are no drugs that are found in his system. Why did the National Science Foundation, which answers only to the President of the United States, appear to block Wormald's inquiries? Now, there we get into something. We'll touch on it more by the end of this episode, but essentially, there's a little bit of a dispute about who actually owns the land in Antarctica. There are some countries that say, well, this is our territory, and other countries just don't acknowledge that. And we kind of have that situation going on between New Zealand and the US with this particular area. Um, so this question about why the National Science Foundation wouldn't exactly be helping this investigation, I think it's still an interesting question just in terms of the humanity of it. And you know, we cooperate with other countries all the time. So what's the issue here? But in terms of the bureaucracy of it, I also understand that there could be a stopgap and that those records could be potentially locked up or sealed. And of course, there's another aspect to this. Uh, could the U.S. be embarrassed about what the detective was finding? Specifically, was it because he found in Antarctica where some of those isolated for six months of darkness drank heavily and used drugs? Marx and Sonia Walter, then 33, were a lively couple involved in the bass band, Fanny Pack and the Big Nancy Boys. Marx dyed his hair purple and Walter's bright green. If I recall correctly, she played bass for the band. Uh, Darren Schneider, who spent the winter there, says, It is rare to see people that seem so perfectly matched. The two became inseparable, and as winter drew closer, Walter was able to change her posting to spend the winter with Marx. On May 11th, according to Walter's statement to police, Marx felt unwell, said he had poor vision, and went to bed early, which is unusual. Uh, by the way, uh, poor vision is a symptom of methanol poisoning, but they didn't catch that. Uh, Walter says Marx woke during the night to take antacid tablets before waking at 5.30 a.m. and vomiting blood. The couple went back to Biomed, the base medical facility, where Dr. Robert... Robo Thompson said he believed the sickness was linked to alcohol withdrawal. Marx told him it was 38 hours since he last drank. Marx shuttled back and forth between his room and biomed. At one stage, Thompson drew blood from Marx's right arm, later saying he noted two other needle marks already there. Marx returned to biomed for oxygen and Valium. Rodney was very agitated, Walter said. He could not lie still and was breathing heavily. By 3 p.m., Marx was back in biomed. Evidence would later be given that an automatic medical analyzer, the Ectochem machine, could have found signs in Marx's blood of methanol poisoning, but it was not working. Without clues to his illness, Marx faded. Walter said, I thought he was getting better. His pupils were huge. They got smaller. He squeezed my hand. He tried to sit up. He then quit breathing and we tried CPR. 
Alarms blared across the base, summoning base staff trained in emergency respiration. They tried for 45 minutes to bring Marks back to life without success. Wormald needed witnesses and asked the NSF to give him access to those who were at the base. It eventually agreed in 2006 to forward a questionnaire to the 49 people Wormald wanted to question, but only after it had approved the questions. Wormald received just 11 responses. I've seen some other claims that it was actually 13, but obviously a small fraction of them. Uh, there was no response from some of the more critical witnesses. Wormald also asked for reports by the NSF into Marx's death and reports into the Ectochem medical computer and was told there were no relevant reports. The NSF said one inquiry was carried out, but because it was of a medical nature, it would be of little value to your inquiry. The coroner disagreed. Medical aspects were vital to the inquiry, McElroy said. Wormald's good police work would later obtain this report and reveal the existence of others. That report contains the statement that the unexpected death of a 32-year-old immediately warrants a homicide investigation. So I don't know about you guys, but with the back and forth I'm seeing here, I'm wondering if there is some aspect to, um, I, don't, I don't know that I would call it a cover-up necessarily, but just to the fact that the NSF does not want this investigator finding the details he's looking for. They kind of agree to, yeah, we'll let you send a questionnaire, but we're going to look at it first. There's not a huge response from that. They're asking for reports that should exist, and they're saying, well, yeah, we've got this report, but it's just, it's about medical stuff. You don't need it. And this is clearly a case where the medical emergency is the core of the case. Um, it's pretty interesting to me that this detective, this guy must be good at his job because he eventually finds out that there are more reports, and he winds up getting copies of those reports. Um, I'm pretty impressed. In the end, the greatest assistance came from two former NSF staff members who were praised by the coroner for coming forward. William Silva, who had worked as a base doctor at a nearby station, was able to provide the medical report carried out by the NSF. He was one of those who reviewed Dr. Thompson's notes and was critical of aspects of his practice. The other was Harry Mahar, who had worked for the NSF in Christchurch as the health and safety officer of the Antarctic program. Wormald tracked him down at the State Department in Washington and in a candid conversation, later sworn in an affidavit, Mehar stated there had been a number of inquiries by the NSF into the circumstances around Marx's death. Along with the medical review, Mehar said lab containers were tested to see if they were correctly marked as methanol and bottles of alcohol were tested to see if their contents matched the labels. At least there, I am getting a sense that the NSF is not being very upfront about the type of investigations that they did, um, because here we have a couple people that are stepping forward and they're saying, no, there was, there was a different type of investigation going on here. And for them to be looking at the actual containers and, you know, doing a test of those containers, looking for the source of methanol, um, certainly seems to me like that's more of an investigation into the death and not necessarily just a medical evaluation like they claimed earlier. There are those who were there during the winter of Marx's death who tell of drug and alcohol abuse at the station. Marx was known to binge drink alcohol. When his room was cleared, there were 18 bottles of liquor in it, even though there was alcohol for the taking at the nearby bar. Members of that winter crew told the Herald on Sunday of marijuana being grown at the base. Scott Hulse said he smelled marijuana being smoked while walking outside the base. Hulse came to believe it was being grown somewhere on the base and suspected plants were hidden in air ducts. Walter, Marx's fiance, wrote on her blog, There is an unbelievable amount of alcohol down here. When questioned by police after Marx's death over the needle marks in his arm, she said she knew of people smoking cannabis at the base, but knew nothing of harder drugs. Along with the alcohol shipped in, there were those on the base who made toast juice. Toast juice, which is considered and discounted as one possible source of the methanol, was brewed on site. When Wormald obtained a bottle for ESR testing, it was found to be 71% pure alcohol. Now, I'm really interested to know why this toast juice was discounted um, from, I, I'm not an expert on this, but from the research I've done in terms of understanding uh, just the alcohol pr brewing process, 
it does create methanol um, once the process starts. And they typically will get rid of a certain amount of the first batch because they know that it contains methanol. Knowing that these guys were kind of doing this homebrew on site and that it was coming out at a pretty strong con concentration. I mean, you're talking 71% pure alcohol. I would really be looking at some possibility that something went wrong with the brewing, with the brewing process. Uh, was Mark's part of the team that was actually brewing this thing? Could it be that, you know, he took a, a sample or had a taste of something to see how it was coming along and maybe there was methanol in it? I don't know. This article is being very direct that this has been discounted. I just have trouble with discounting it. I don't know enough about the details and I'm just wondering more about it. We also had a uh, statement that was given by Dr. Robo Thompson before Marx's cause of death became known. And that is the statement about that intravenous uh, drug use. According to Thompson, the instances were in the distant past, with the exception of a party in Christchurch before coming to the poll. It was also Thompson's testimony that Marx, who was right-handed, had two needle marks on his right arm when brought into the biomed on the day he died. Thompson chose this site to draw blood to test, although the Marx family have questioned why Thompson would use the same site. Uh, now, if this was a television show, um, you know, I think everyone would be wondering right off the bat, well, hold on, how's he, he's right-handed and why are the needle marks in his right arm? Um, once again, I don't know enough about this subject. Uh, I, I do know a little bit and I know that sometimes people will change what arm they're going into because they're having trouble with veins on one arm. I don't know if that's the type of use that we're talking about here. Uh, outside of that, it might not be all that uncommon for people to uh, shoot up into their dominant arm. I just, I don't know, but I certainly wouldn't lean on that as an investigative tool um, for trying to determine, you know, did someone come and stick this guy? And the other thing that's weird about this, I know there's a bit of focus about these needle marks. The uh, coroners are very clear that this was methanol through ingestion. So those needle marks in terms of his death, I don't feel like they really connect or that they come into play, but I just wanted to cover that with you guys because it's being kind of so heavily discussed in the articles on this. The autopsy of Marx showed no sign of illicit drugs, only trace amounts of alcohol and a high concentration of methanol. In eight years, Wormald learned a lot, but nothing that answered the questions he wanted. With no definite answers, those who knew Marx have taken sides based on their memories. Schneider says, I believe Rodney's death was a tragic accident, a terrible mistake on Rodney's part. There is nothing to indicate how he could have made such a mistake and plenty to indicate he should not have made this mistake. And this is what makes his death so difficult to come to terms with. Harvard professor doc, Dr. Anthony Stark, who supervised Marx and communicated with him daily, recalls having a routine discussion about lab safety early in his employment. It was hardly necessary to do so because he was a professional who was well-versed in laboratory techniques and safety. Drinking a lethal dose during lab work was essentially impossible. It was a terrible death of someone who was young and full of promise. I don't understand the cause, and I don't know if we ever will. So there we've got someone that essentially maybe because he was responsible for supervising Marx, um, maybe he doesn't want to admit that there was some possibility that the training wasn't solid enough, uh, or that maybe he had made an assumption about Marx and how methodical he was about handling uh, chemicals. Maybe there's a bias there, but his opinion is extremely strong that it's impossible that this happened accidentally. Now, there's another aspect that came out with the investigation on this that I want to touch on. Uh, interestingly, at Men's Journal, this is not a source that we really have on the channel here too often, uh, but a couple things I wanted to bring up. First of all, they have more details on that piece of medical equipment. Base physician Robert Thompson had given testimony a month earlier, revealing that while Marx laid there dying, his potential lifeline was sitting dormant in a corner of the room, that Ectochem blood analyzer. Its single tiny lithium ion battery had died and therefore the machine lost its calibration every time it was turned off. Once turned back on, it took up to nine hours to recalibrate. 
Thompson had known about the malfunction, even reported it to Raytheon, but for some reason never attempted to fix it and decided against simply leaving it on. So that would have been the other possibility. Um, if this thing is essentially losing its memory every time it's shut off, just leave it plugged in and leave it on. But this is not a piece of equipment that would be used typically on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I imagine that in that scenario, they're probably pretty aware of conserving their resources. So I don't know that leaving it on was really a feasible thing either. Um, it does occur to me that, you know, the first time that he came in complaining, could they have put it on at that point, started the calibration process, and maybe could they have tested him in time to try to save him in some way? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's quite enough time there for that, but it's really a shame that we're literally talking about just one small battery that had to be replaced and that piece of equipment could have been operational and ready um, to treat him. And there is essentially treatments that you can do. Uh, had his condition been caught in time, reversing the effects could have been a simple matter of running a mixture of ethanol and saline through his body. Even if it hadn't saved his life, it would have immediately raised the question of how methanol could have possibly gotten into his system. And of course, if they knew that at that time, the whole investigation on site would have gone, I'm pretty sure, completely different. I'm pretty sure they would have been looking for the source of methanol. I'm pretty sure that his room would have been processed in a much different way. Um, so even if they couldn't get that analysis in time, just knowing that would have thrown this investigation in a completely different direction. But unfortunately, that is not what occurred. So what does the investigator Wormald say about all this? Common sense told us there were only four possibilities as to how Rodney came to ingest the methanol. One, that he drank it willingly and knowingly with the intention of getting a high. Two, that he took it to end his life. Three, that he took it accidentally. And finally, that someone had spiked his drink, possibly as a prank or even knowing that it would either make him very ill or kill him. Um, if we don't believe that he would have that he would have sought help uh, if he was trying to end his own life, I don't know that I can believe that he would have sought help and not told them that, hey, by the way, I took a drink of this stuff. I thought it was going to mess me up and it just now I'm sick and I don't know what to do. I mean, he was able to talk to them as he was going through this. And if he was really concerned that his life was ending, which it indeed was, I'm pretty sure that he would have shared that information with them. We don't have that happen. So um, for option one, he drank it willingly, uh, thinking it would get him high. I don't think so. Option two, Everyone close to him doesn't think that that's a possibility, and the logic of the steps that he took don't seem to support that. Uh, option three, that he took it accidentally, I think there's something to that. I still think it's a possibility. And of course, option four, that someone spiked his drink, either as a prank or intentionally trying to harm him. Uh, still a possibility on the table here. Wormald would eventually learn that Marx's workspace was notoriously messy. Bottles of lab agents like methanol and ethanol were often strewn about alongside a dozen or so empty bottles of alcohol. Now, that's probably one of the most interesting points that I've heard in this whole thing, only because it gives us some insight into the possibility that this could have been an accident. And maybe those comments about how meticulous he was with his work aren't necessarily the truth. It could be that those are being romanticized a bit or that people have biases because of feeling some level of responsibility in some way. Um, I was very curious to hear that. It's really not what I expected uh, while I was going through all this, but that is what I found. So the updates on this story seem to stop until 2016. The Journal News in Hamilton, Ohio, runs another story about crime and punishment in Antarctica. And they're talking a little bit more about that dynamic I was talking about where you have different countries that don't quite recognize um, each other's claims there. But there's a general rule that the countries do follow, which is if a crime is committed there, and this article talks about, I think, a, a cook, if I recall correctly, that attacks someone with a hammer, um, the person that's committing the crime, whatever home country they're from, those are the laws that they're held 
uh, accountable to. What's an interesting thought there is if you have someone committing a crime and you have a victim that are in different countries, what's going to happen there? And I don't think we've quite seen a situation like that. But kind of as a footnote to this, Rodney's case is uh, once again brought up. And it ends with the fact that, you know, they've investigated it, but they still don't know exactly what happened. And it could possibly be Antarctica's only recorded murder. I'm going to include another link down below to another page at southpolestation.com. This is essentially um, memories of Rodney that have been sent in from all kinds of different people. And there is just, there's beautiful pictures that Rodney took. Um, there are just amazing messages from everyone about how much they enjoyed him, how much they enjoyed working with him, what type of person he was. Some really touching messages. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through them all here, but you can just see this huge amount of support and love for this guy that was unfortunately taken too early in a way that we don't really clearly understand. Other ways that Rodney has been memorialized is uh, a big one, literally. Mount Marks is a broad ice-covered mountain rising to 2,600 meters or 8,500 feet in the Worcester Range of Antarctica. It was named after Rodney Marks. Uh, also, the following year, they went out to the South Pole and they put up a sign in his honor as well. Rodney Marks, friend, musician, astronomer, South Pole 2000. So what do you think, Brain Scratchers? Um, you know, it's for me, it boils down to what the investigator was saying about the four theories. We either have this guy that took a drink thinking it was going to give him an extra kind of buzz. Seems like he's a pretty smart guy. I don't think he would have done something like that. Uh, we have the possibility that he did it on accident, which once we have the investigator's information about his workspace and how messy that is, I think there's some possibility we have to consider that. The possibility he did this to end his own life doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. People don't seem to agree with that sentiment either. Um, or kind of the last one we're left with. Did one of those 49 people slip this to him to either prank him, possibly make him sick or worse? And we don't have the answer. That's why it's a brain scratch. Thank you so much for joining me here. I really appreciate having you guys out there. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new case cracked on the Lord and Arts channel.